scripture reading this morning will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. My version differs from what I see on the screen, so I'll read what you see. It'll be the same thing, but different wording. Beginning in verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but none but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we, for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest... When I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Be seated, please. We're very pleased to see everybody that's out here this morning. Appreciate everyone that has come here for the purpose of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's always a blessing to be able to come together, especially after we deal with all the things the devil throws at us in this life. Each and every day of our life, the things we have to deal with, that the devil tries to make us have a weaker faith, that tries to get us to fall away, to come together and to be re-energized spiritually, to be encouraged by seeing so many people that are out here this morning that, are, uh, that have a love for the Lord and to know that there are others of like precious faith. We appreciate that and we hope that we can continue feeding, feeding one another this morning as we have been doing since the last hour. We've had a good service so far this morning. Appreciate the songs that were led in our presence. The song we just finished singing a moment ago brings back so many fond memories to me. They're all beautiful songs, but I remember as a young man growing up and listening, uh, hearing Brother Craig Mead and his son Brian, they were they tended to be the, the bass uh, people you'd hear in your background as you were singing that particular song. And I remember when we'd get to that the chorus and Brother Craig Mead would just get right into that and he'd be he'd be singing right along, go preach it and uh, and everything. And he was it was just a beautiful song. Appreciate that. Appreciate the encouragement and edification that we always get. We are able to come together and give God the glory. And I hope that we continue to do that today. Our scripture reading this morning is meant to evoke in our minds thoughts about athletics and such that are connected to that. A few weeks ago, we started a series of lessons about discipleship. And in that, series, and in that particular lesson, some of the things we talked about was the idea that if we want to be true disciples of Jesus, it involves us having a full commitment to the Lord, having our eyes set on the Lord, having a mind uh, focused on serving God, being willing and committed and preparing ourselves to walk in His footsteps. When we look at the definition of what a disciple is in general, we know that it means a learner. But more than that, in the scriptures, we understand that we are, when we are learning about Jesus and we're striving to be that a disciple of the Lord, we're trying to not only learn about Him, we are trying to recreate Him in our lives, if you will. That is to say, we're trying to emulate the characteristics of Jesus. We want to do the same things that He did. We want to walk in His steps and, and live a life of a, of a child of God that is pleasing to God in saving souls just as Jesus came here and preached about the Lord, preached about God, and set the example of dedication. In the first century, when the Apostle Paul would have penned this, the Apostle Paul would have had in his mind something that would have been familiar to the audience of his day, and it even rings true even today. In the first century, one of the things that was popular amongst the Greeks was the idea of sports, and our modern-day Olympics is actually a derivative of the athleticism that went on in the first century. They had a various different games that they engaged in, boxing and racing and javelin throwing and things such as that. In fact, they were trained for, uh, with rigorous training. Their individuals would have to train perhaps for a year straight in order to even be able to participate in the games. The word that we have today in our English language for exercise comes from a Greek word, gymnazo, G-U-M-N-A-Z-O. And if you was to write that down, unless you have a mental picture of it, you can see how it seems very close to our modern gymnasium. English word, gymnasium. And that's where we get that word from. But literally, what that word meant, that word meant uh, to train or to, or to exercise, and actually, exercise in the mood. 
it's, it's ridiculous what they did. Not only did they try to make sure that their bodies were strengthened, they made sure that they didn't have anything holding them back, and so they would, they would, that's how they would actually compete. I'm glad we don't do that today, and I'm sure our athletes are as well. But they were very dedicated. They are very committed to making sure that they, those who competed in, in the race or the boxing or whatever it was, that they understood the commitment that they had to make, the amount of training that they had to be engaged in, and the focus that they had to have. And when Paul makes allusion to it here and in other places in the New Testament, it's to help us understand that analogy, to paint that picture, if you will, of what kind of commitment a disciple needs to have. In our modern day, we think about people who are at their peak performance and people that are able to go out and be the MVP in each and every game, perhaps as someone that you might call an all-star. I think uh, for my generation, a Michael Jordan. Maybe some of you younger folk can think of somebody else. Maybe LeBron James or somebody. I don't know. Maybe I'm still dating myself. But here's the thing. We know that there are individuals who we see as icons who are at their peak, who are able to do things that we just ordinary individuals just cannot do. And we often will look at them and, and classify them as being all-stars. If you and I want to be the right kind of disciple that the Lord wants us to be, we have to have a commitment like those all-stars of old, like those all-stars of even today, when we think about the idea of the commitment that we need to have. And Paul was talking about that here in 1 Corinthians 9. We want to take a look at that this morning and also some other passages and make some application to our lives when we think about being committed being that kind of disciple that the Lord would have us to be, when we think about what does discipleship look like, one of the portraits that we can see when we look at the, the picture of discipleship is that of an athlete. And so let's think about some things this morning to help us understand that a little more closely. Now understand, the first thing we want to, we want to talk about is just the, the training that I mentioned a moment ago. It was rigorous for the athlete of the first century. To be able to throw that javelin where he wanted it to go. To be able to lift whatever heavy object it was they were trying to lift. Or to defeat whatever opponent it was that they were going up against. Whether it be wrestling or boxing or what have you. So Paul makes the analogy in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24 when he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? There may be a lot of people, just like there's many of us today, here in this building, who are striving to go to heaven. Now in a physical race or physical competition... We understand one person is going to be crowned first place, crowned the winner. Thankfully, that's not the way the Lord looks at it from that standpoint. Every one of us has the chance to go to heaven, and there's room for every one of us and more should we have the kind of commitment that a disciple of Christ needs to have in order to make it to the finish line. Now, Paul says that's the kind of focus that you need to have, a focus that is fully committed and training yourself spiritually to get to that point. The athlete who's running in a race, whether it be a modern race or, or a race of the first century, understands and understood how crucial it is to train yourself. Thus, in the first century, they had a training that was, as I said, like a year-long uh, training before they could even be ready to be in the Olympics or whatever particular athletic competition it was that they were in. It's crucial. And it's tantamount to be per to persevere. Notice Paul went on to say, but one receives a prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Perseverance and endurance are words that come to mind when I think about a race because we realize that we need, we often talk about how we need to pace ourselves. You start out strong, you start out really fast, and you wear out if you don't have the endurance to continue to the end. Some of us, all of us, have no idea how long we're going to be here on this earth. And so it's going to require endurance for us to be committed to being disciples of Christ from the day we've obeyed the gospel to, the, to whatever day it is that we leave this world. And so Paul says you have to be committed and you have to have perseverance. And he goes on and says in verse 25, And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. And that's the idea that I was talking about a moment ago when we cross the finish line and we're given that crown. We're given that home in heaven someday. Now Paul said in order for an athlete to reach that goal of being the one that successfully competes and makes it from start to finish has to practice self-control. And self-control for an athlete would be things such as controlling their diet, 
making sure that they're not eating uh, too much junk food or, or making sure that they're exercising on a regular basis, making sure that they're keeping their body toned and they're out there running and lifting and doing all the things that they need to do so that they get to the point that they're able to compete uh, when it comes time for their, for their uh, match to, to begin. We have to practice spiritual self-control from the standpoint that we need to perhaps uh, watch what it is that we take in our bodies, whether it be drugs or alcohol, things such as that. We have to practice self-control when it comes to making sure that we study the Bible, making sure that we, we run the Christian race, and, and, and all the things that are involved in following in the footsteps of Jesus. And so the commitment of an athlete, the rigorous training that an athlete has from the physical standpoint is a metaphor for the rigorous training that we as children of God need to have from a spiritual standpoint. And then when we do that, when we get involved in the training, just as the athlete gets involved in the competition and has rules to follow, we too have rules that we need to follow in order to stay in the race. He says in verse 26, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. It's interesting because here Paul reminds us the fact that, that, the, that the athlete who is out competing, say for instance, he's in a marathon race. He knows where he's going. He's not out there racing and he has no idea where the track is going to lead. A few weeks back, Angie and I went down to downtown Pottville on a Saturday and we did a 5K. And throughout the town of Pottville, they had signs set up to let us know that when we got to a certain part of the sidewalk, we, were able, we needed to take a left or we needed to take a right. And, and it helped tell us where we needed to go. And Paul says that, that he fights not with uncertainty. He runs uh, in a way that he knows where he's going, not as one who's running with uncertainty, rather, or one that's beating the air. <coughs> An individual that's in a boxing match who beats the air means he's wasting the energy. But it also would be somebody that maybe he's, he's not boxing or punching in the direction of his opponent, too. In other words, he doesn't know what he's looking for, doesn't know where he's going, he's uncertain. We cannot go through the life of being a Christian aimlessly. There's direction that we have to follow. There's a course that we are on. And so we have to run that course. And how are we going to know what that course is? Well, we're going to know by training ourselves. And that training comes about through God's Word and, 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 and immersing ourselves in God's Word. And so he says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. So not only does he know the race, not only does he know what the end goal is and how to get there and to stay on the path, he knows who his opponent is. If he's racing against somebody, he knows... He knows their strengths. He knows their weaknesses. He knows who it is he needs to defeat. In our case, the devil. And not only that, though, but he makes sure that he follows the rules because what happens if a, 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 a contestant, an athlete, or someone does not follow the rules? He's so disqualified. They're so, sorry, you're out. So you're disqualified. You see that in, in, in various different sports arenas. Somebody, perhaps, in a boxing match, uses a move that is not an allowed move, disqualified. Uh, basketball, uh, we see after so many fouls, a person gets fouled out, they're disqualified because they got too many fouls. But if they do something that's just outright outlandish physically, maybe hitting another player or something like that, they're going to be thrown out of the game. You're disqualified. There's rules to follow in the games. But the thing about being a disciple of Christ versus the games is that being a Christian is not a game. And that's why it's so important that we understand the difference and talk about the things that pertain to running this life and having an all-star commitment to being a disciple of our Lord. Now, another passage of Scripture similar to these here is in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Where the Hebrew writer said, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have, a, we have a tendency in our society today to reward people with participation trophies. You participated, here's your trophy. Christian life's not like that. Simply competing and simply training, though competing and training are part of the process, those two things alone are not enough. We can't just simply say, I tried. The Bible tells us here to do it with endurance. 
The Bible tells us to practice self-control and lay aside anything that would prevent us from completing the race. As a matter of fact, he says, let us lay aside every weight and sin. You know, I used to look at that verse and think that that weight and sin were equated to one another. The more I study on this, the more I realize that the weight that he's talking about here isn't necessarily sinful in and of themselves, but they can become that. You see, I could do many things that are innocent, but when they begin to take away from my time to train to be a disciple committed to the Lord with all-star commitment, then they become weights that are weighing me down, and that gets into sin. Too much television. Too much time on my cell phone. Too much time playing video games. Too much time doing other things, whatever it might be. As one person said, I, I, I was reading, he said, if you're, if you're too busy, you're too busy. We've got to make time for the Lord. The athlete that wants to be able to, to dunk the ball or the, or the runner who wants to be able to make it to first place knows that he can't just sit around all day. He's got to make time. He's got to put it in his head that I must practice. I must train. And if I, as a child of God, want to be the kind of disciple that walks in the footsteps of Jesus, I have to be focused and say, okay, this is a weight in my life, whatever it is. It has to go. I have to put it aside. This I can't do this today, or I just can't do it ever because it seems to be something that is a constant distraction to me. It's a weight. I got to get rid of. I got to get off some excess weight that's holding me back from serving the Lord and sin. So these things that hold me back, they cause me to be too busy to serve the Lord, to be too busy to prepare and to train. Because I do those things so much, what happens to my faith? My faith begins to waver, and then guess what happens? Sin. And so the writer here says, let us run with endurance. It might take some endurance on our part. A lot of self-control. A lot of, of self-motivation. A lot of willpower to get there. Now these athletes that do that, these athletes that are able to have this kind of commitment, they do so because it becomes a routine to them. And they exercise. And they exercise. And they exercise. And they know that there's certain types of exercises that they can engage in that will help them, whether it be lifting weights or doing sit-ups or, or, or running or, or walking and that sort of thing. The Apostle Paul makes another analogy along those lines when he was writing to Timothy when he said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, but I reject, or rather, but reject profane and old, way, old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little... But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Paul uses the idea of exercising and the things that we do from a physical standpoint to, to build up our bodies and to be uh, prepared to be an, an athlete or, or a soldier or whatever it is that requires us to be physically prepared. And he, and he compares the physical exercise to the idea of spiritual exercise. When he says to exercise ourselves unto godliness. So again, the, the all-star, MVP, top-notch athlete may have a regular routine where they get up in the morning, they eat a certain thing, they will maybe meditate, they may do some push-ups, they may go out for a jog, they may go to the gym, they may find themselves lifting some weights or getting on the elliptical, and then they go home, they get some rest, they may, they may drink something with electrolytes, they'll do something, and the next day they get up and they do it again. So they have certain things that they do that are components of their exercise regimen. Paul says here to exercise ourselves unto godliness, which means we need to have a spiritual regimen, if you will. There are some things we can do spiritually to help us be that all-star that, we, that we've been talking about this morning. And let's take a look at those for a moment and the remainder of our lesson and make some application. And one of those is simply pray. I like the picture here of the individual down on his knees because it makes me think that from a physical standpoint when we maybe stretch just before we race, when we do squats, when we want to try to loosen up our legs and get ourselves in shape. This is some spiritual stretching. This is some spiritual squatting, if you will. When we sit down and we pray, and notice how Paul uses athletic terminology when he talks about the idea of praying when we are exercising ourselves unto spiritualness, unto godliness. He says in Romans 15, 30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together 
with me in prayers to God for me. When an individual is engaged in some sort of competition with someone, they're striving with them. Or we're striving either against somebody that's our opponent or we're, or we're striving along with our teammates towards a goal. And Paul uses it in that manner. Here we are, teammates, 